Good afternoon. Welcome to the Fostering Medication Safety in Hospitals webinar. The event is part of the WHO's World Patient Safety Day, which reaffirms WHO's global safety uh, challenge, Medication Without Harm, launched in 2017 to reduce severe avoidable medication-related harm by 50% by 2022. The co-organizers are the uh, European Health Management, Health Management Association, EMA, and the International Alliance of Patients Organizations, IATO. My name is Annette Rusanov, and I'm the, I'm the Program and Policy Director at EMA. EMA's vision is excellent health management for a healthy Europe, which we achieve by supporting the spread of knowledge on effective health management. And a good example is uh, this webinar, for instance. IAPO is a global alliance representing patients of all nations across all disease areas. IAPO has been advocating for patient-centered healthcare worldwide for over 22 years with the collaboration of almost 300 member organizations. The objective of this event is to raise awareness of the benefits of medication safety in the context of the strategic framework of the Global Patient Safety Challenge its four domains, three action areas, and 16 subdomains, as the graph graphic shows now on the screen. Without further ado, let me introduce you uh, to our four speakers. Dr. Andreas Schüler, president of the uh, European Association of Hospital Pharmacists, Claude Pschemi, CEO of IAPO, Muriel Schneider, Program Director of the Global Self-Care Federation, and Professor Sandra Budijic and Emma Chair, Head of Health Systems Management and Leadership Department at the University of Malta, Consultant in Public Health Medicine, and Chair of the Patient Safety and Quality Improvement Team at Mater Dei Hospital in Malta. So you can see that we have brought together a, a varied panel representing different uh, stakeholder views on medication safety, which will foster hopefully a very um, useful and very inspiring discussion in the coming hour. Before we start the panel discussion, let me remind you of some housekeeping rules. Please keep your uh, microphones muted during the whole uh, webinar. If you have questions, please drop them into the uh, question and answer box, and we will take them after the panel discussion. I would like to remind you that this webinar is being recorded uh, because we would like to make the recording and the short follow-up report uh, available for those who cannot make it today. Uh, with this, uh, I will start the panel discussion and I will, keep, uh, I will call our uh, speakers one by one uh, to make their uh, short uh, pitch presentation and then we will open the floor for questions. Usual suspects of medication harm related to uh, medication management and prescription and administration are already well known. But Andreas Schüler in his talk will shed light on unusual suspects of medication harm, like transition in care. Andreas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Annette. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and uh, a very good afternoon to all of you. Um, word patient safe today, uh, in our opinion, is really of paramount importance uh, to, to shine a bright light on the multitude of factors influencing actual patient safety during our everyday practices as, as healthcare professionals. Just as we heard uh, in, in the introduction, and just as it will be shown to you all by my dear colleagues today, Patient safety does have many aspects, ranging from logistics, availability of a product, availability of personnel, of technology, and last but not least, availability of skills and knowledge. There is um, an ever-changing balance uh, among these dimensions, one being more of an obstacle than others, and this kind of changes in time and by geopolitical and geographical locations as well. From my perspective, representing practicing hospital and clinical pharmacists, our main focus uh, is on medication safety and medication-related harm. 
I would even say that perhaps uh, this is one of the most under-researched and under-diagnosed and underappreciated risks for, uh, source for everyday healthcare practice. In our time and within our region, uh, it's not only comparable, but even it might exceed the risk uh, posed by counterfeit medications and even shortages to some extent. The usual suspects, just like Anat put it previously, stem from uh, medication-related errors and harm stemming from logistics, preparation, compounding of medications, but also the very usual suspect of uh, dispensing medications to individual patients, let them be in a pharmacy, in a retail pharmacy, in the primary care level, or in hospital pharmacies uh, within the hospital setting. We would, however, propose a bit broader and more holistic approach, looking at this whole issue from the patient's point of view. And from the patient's point of view, medication is a process, almost even like a story, that as such starts at the first, at the very first instance, the medicinal therapy is induced. And that very instance can be uh, happening even years earlier than the actual hospitalization is occurring. And uh, if we are talking about chronic or long-term therapies, more often than not, this is very well the case in our everyday practice. And also this process or this story of a medication for a patient, uh, this includes therapeutic decision-making, it includes prescribing of certain medications, uh, dispensing, the one, of, one of the usual suspects I alluded to previously, and also the administration uh, of such uh, therapies. But um, this is not the whole picture, I have to say. Everything in between those very discrete steps, including errors from the information transfer, including misunderstandings within communication between healthcare professionals, including the mishandling of patient data within the paper-based or electronic health records uh, can arise uh, in transcribing errors. It can uh, even um, augment uh, the issue of look-alike, sound-alike uh, medication problems. Um, and the final part of this equation, I would say, is uh, the fragmented nature of how healthcare is delivered uh, during everyday practice. It is hugely important to see from the, from the patient's point of view, but also for ourselves as medical professionals, that patient care does not end and does not start by the boundaries, by the walls of a single uh, healthcare institution like a hospital. Uh, Patient care should not start at the admission of a patient to the hospital and should not end at their discharge. Patient care includes any, everything be, before that actually happens. We call that prehabilitation uh, within our everyday practice. And also it should continue afterwards. Uh, uh, patients need that uh, medication therapeutic information with themselves once they leave the hospital. And it is uh, hugely helpful to um, general practitioners within the primary care setting and even uh, community pharmacists so that medicinal therapeutic information follows the patients. And this is uh, also one of the things we usually call seamless care or seamless transfer of care between the certain levels of the healthcare system. Uh, from which uh, very major medication-related risks could arise, and we really need to tackle those issues, uh, preferably before they even uh, come true. So um, looking at this whole picture, uh, we, we can safely say that uh, these risks and probably some of the errors arising from those risks have been hiding in plain, plain sight for many years, I would, even, I would say even for decades now. And most of the quality assurance or quality management studies that have been uh, published within this area put medication-related errors in the so-called never category. So they should never happen in an ideal world, 
yet uh, studies also show that they can happen as frequently as 50% of cases, so that is half of the cases for IV administration, and uh, beyond 40% for ward stock based dispensing by nurses. This is clearly more than uh, a never occurrence. Luckily, uh, we can say that the solution is, uh, is there. The solution is, is very much available, and, and I would say it's much less technology intensive or in return, uh, much less expensive than dealing with counterfeit medication uh, through other uh, IT solutions uh, we have seen during the past couple of years. So um, the potential is there to solve these more uh, severe problems. We are hard, uh, trying hard and we are advocating strongly for the inclusion of pharmacology expertise within the whole medication process um, because evidence shows that that expertise, so the inclusion of, for example, a clinical pharmacist within this process to, to become um, some sort of an overseer or, or an overseeing entity within this, this process can really minimize these errors in multiple real life trials. And this brings me to the conclusion and, and a one last message I would like to highlight. Uh, and that uh, highlights the importance of real life data and real world evidence when we are tackling uh, any uh, problems or issues that are so delicate and so multidimensional like this. Whatever we choose to do, whomever uh, is entitled to, to influence these systems and these processes, it must be measurable. And not only that, but it also must be measured. And only then, once this real life evidence is there, then that evidence can inform policymaking uh, and policymakers to do the right thing and tackle these issues and, and include all the expertise that is right now out there who could really minimize these issues and become uh, or make them become more close to the never occurring uh, issue. Uh, they just need to be informed and the evidence has to be shown and created. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andres, for this uh, very complete overview about the seamless transfer of care and the uh, hidden or non-existent yet existing medication errors and uh, also for offering us a solution. Uh, so there is, uh, there is hope. Um, let's move on uh, to, although uh, we had in Andras' uh, speech already the patient perspective, now let's uh, go deeper into the uh, patient uh, perspective and patient roles uh, with uh, Kualdip uh, Shemi, uh, who will talk about the five moments of medication safety and patients' role in them. Kualdip, how do patients engage with healthcare professionals in prescription and administration of medication? I think, firstly, uh, I'm so glad that uh, patients are sitting at this forum. Uh, very often, you find that uh, when issues of patient safety were discussed, patients were not invited to sit at those tables. So this is so pleasing and very important for us uh, on this World Patient Safety Day. So firstly, I think my suggestion is that involve patients in all patient safety matters. We are the stakeholder that gets things done to them. You know, we have the worst outcomes out of a patient harm situation. But at the same time, health systems that are very uh, knowledgeable and very understanding consider patients as a resource. They are, we are a resource of ideas. We see things, we see pathways, we see what's wrong and what's right. To answer your question, I think the five moments of medication that the WHO has really promoted is that, firstly, it's a right of a patient and a duty and I think responsibility of a patient and the carer that before starting a medication, they find out all about this medication, what it is, what's its name, uh, what it comes from. For instance, with biologics and biosimilars of theirs, I can quote examples. They're not the same, they're similar, but you've got to find out more about this. So it's very important that we have that information available from both sides. Where information is not um, 
what it says, easy to access. Uh, patients have a duty to inform their healthcare providers and even pharmaceutical companies, but please produce information that is easily understandable by them. Do feedback. So that's the first moment. At the start of that, you must make sure you've got that. Now, one, the other moment that comes in really is when you start taking that medication, uh, please do find out what that medication actually does with the uh, other things around you. What are you taking? What are your conditions? As you know, um, in the best will of the um, health professional providers, sometimes the medication records are not accurate. We don't have a um, good uh, understanding. Uh, with electronic medical records, which are accessible patients, but patients can look into those, we can actually add in the missing pieces. So it's very important for us so that patients do look at the medical records. What medication are you taking at the moment? How it can interact with other medication, so forth. Then the next moment, I think, which is uh, very important, and if we have humorized this, we have released five very brilliant cartoons. Please look at our website and have a look at that. Add your own caption with it. The next uh, moment, I think, is very important for us is that reviewing this medicine, I think, there's no point in taking prolonged any medicine without reviewing it constantly. When reviewing this medicine, just look at it. Do you still need it? Uh, is it important for you to continue with this? Is there some other better version of it come out? Uh, is there something that you can change? And at all this time, throughout this um, uh, stages, patient and the provider dialogue must carry on openly and freely. It must be in an honest, open question, and it must be felt that you're culturally sensitive in replying to that, age sensitive, uh, gender sensitive, and it's very important to make sure that when you have age differences, uh, that you do produce some uh, information. And especially now, I'm very proud of that the Apple and others are working on access to medicine for people with disability, especially uh, looking at people with sight and uh, even intellectual disabilities to help them out. And as you go proceed along the line of five moments of medication, you can look at that quite interestingly how it carries on. Then comes a really a uh, case whereby you have to uh, add another, another medicine. I think that's a critical one that really uh, is a high sense, and especially in transition of care, as you mentioned. When you're in accident emergency, you're lying there, you have one set of drugs being administered that they're just to keep you alive, you know. But as your care gets transited into others, you have to reduce the dose of medication, you may have to change medication, and especially when you go home again. That's very important for you to look at. Every time there's a sense of change, do find out more. There should be an additional uh, patient care and compassionate care, I suppose you can say, of providing that information and change. And lastly, to summarize everybody, it's really when you don't need medication, you have to stop taking some medication upon advice, but do ask how you come off that medication. No point in abandoning your medicine quickly and without concern. Please make sure you work with the health professional. If, is it a dose that needs to be reduced slowly? Is there something about starting another medication as you leave one. So you may, you may have to titrate the strength half of the other medicines before you leave this one. And all those uh, moments are very important. That is essential to our patient care that these are there. Then my overarching uh, aim is really to make sure patients form strong peer groups within the patient community you have. In case you're dialysis patients, talk to other patients who are not, uh, you think are vulnerable and uh, information deficient, form your little patient groups within your hospital care units. Uh, make sure they are fully understanding what uh, treatment needs. Be a channel, even maybe set up your own webinars, or maybe set up your own Facebook pages so that you can share information consistently. And those are central points. And forever be vigilant, uh, report uh, any, uh, issues that are coming through. Uh, if there is an issue of um, practice, do report it. If it's an issue of human resource, report it. If it's an issue of patient um, uh, failure, please do report it. I think it's very important to us. That's for all patients if we do this. And I think 
There's a whole set of resources produced by the World Patient Safety Day team, and I hope you all access it for your future. Thank you very much for your time given. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gwadi, for uh, walking us through uh, the duties, responsibilities uh, of, of patients. And we will um, uh, remain with these, um, the idea of these active, proactive agents of uh, uh, medication uh, administration. Um, and drawing on the engagement messages uh, delivered by Kwadi, Muriel Schneider will continue uh, the narrative along uh, similar lines, but she will focus on health literacy and patient empowerment. Uh, Muriel will talk about how health literacy can empower patients in making better health decisions, and therefore preventing medication errors in self-care context. Muriel, why and how is health literacy a key enabler for self-care and avoiding errors? Thank you, Annette. And hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. And thanks to Emma and Ayapu for inviting the Global Self-Care Federation for this webinar. I'm going to, in the next 10 minutes, give you an overview of one of our key initiatives, which Annette mentioned, how improving health literacy can support self-care practices and as well empower patients in making better health decisions. And actually, it's, it's good to hear Andras and Kowaldeep talking about uh, that patient care doesn't only start at the beginning of entering the hospital, but it's as well should be around everywhere, not just at hospital care. So just to provide you a, a quick overview, let's just go to the next slide, please. And a quick word about ourselves. So for those who are not familiar, we represent organization from the self-care industry, which includes consumer healthcare companies, as well as regional and national association across the world. We've been collaborating with WHO since 1977, and our key ambition is to get a WHO resolution on self-care, because we believe that self-care intervention for every country in the world and economic settings represent a viable solution to reach the universal health coverage. So just next slides, please. Just to provide a little bit of more context before I share about health literacy, uh, self-care has a lot of different definition. Um, so we will base ourselves with the WHO definition, which is stating that self-care is the ability of individuals, families, and communities to promote health, prevent disease, maintain health, and cope with illness and disability with or without the support of a healthcare provider. And self-care products include a very a diverse um, categories of, of uh, non-prescription medicine, as well as food supplement and medical device. And according to self-care self practices, you can categorize that under self-management, self-monitoring, self-assessment. So self-care happens in everyday life and not just during the hospital stays and at different stage of your health as well. So just to illustrate that, next slide, please, let me show you what we call the self-care continuum. And that has been published um, from an organization in the UK showing that self-care starts with the individual responsibility of the people in taking, uh, making daily choices about their lifestyles, such as brushing your teeth, eating healthily, choosing to do exercise, but as you move and you slide along the scale from the left to the right, people can often take care of themselves as well when they have minor ailments, common symptoms such as cough and sore throats. Um, and there you can use over-the-counter medicine. The same is true when you have long-term conditions where people can often self-manage them without the intervention of a health professional such as diabetes and chronic disease. On the opposite end of the continuum, that's where the major trauma is and where responsibility for care is entirely in the hands of a healthcare professional until the start of recovery when self-care can begin again. So embedding self-care practices into healthcare continuum has the potential to improve health and the quality of life while simultaneously supporting the healthcare sustainability. So the aim is not to see self-care as an ad hoc solution, but embed it into the healthcare system. Next slide, please. 
Um, so this is just to give you why health literacy has come up as an important aspect and why we are focusing on some of our work there. Um, we working towards our ambition as getting the WHO resolution on self-care, we have recently published several reports highlighting the importance to embed self-care as a key component for healthcare system. Last September, we shared a tool for countries to assess their readiness in self-care called the Readiness Self-Care Index. Uh, and that provided countries to um, have an assessment on their strengths as well as the area of improvements and to provide them tools to talk to policymakers and make self-care a priority. Um, we are, last May, we published one of the first global study on the value, the social and economic value of self-care. And that includes data from low and middle income countries, which is really providing a truly global experience perspective. And all these reports, health literacy was highlighted as a key enabler for self-care. So we have, as well on top of that, published a white paper which showed the importance of self-care along with some key recommendations that um, we would like to share with you today. So next slide. And just to briefly brush on the health literacy, likely, likewise uh, for self-care, health literacy has different definition. A very long one, more mostly from the WHO can be found on the glossary, but for the sake of just being more um, uh, brief, let me just share this one with you. So it's, it says that bro health literacy can be broadly defined by the cognitive and social skills which determine the motivation and ability of individual to gain access to, understand and use information in ways which promote and maintain good health. And that was clearly from the WHO Health 2020 strategy, highlighting how health literacy is a key element in promoting empowerment of, patient, um, uh, of patients, as well as driving equity. Next slides, please. Um, so along with Christine Sorensen, who is a founder of the Global Health Literacy Academy, we have conducted some research to understand the gaps and opportunities in improving health literacy, given our global reach. And by studying and comparing behaviors of two types of patients, one high health literate and another limited health literate, it helped us define recommendation and key areas of action. And the research has shown us that the consumer journey differs substantially depending on their level of health literacy. So, for example, a high self-care literate persona maintain their health, take action to promote their overall be well-being, leading them to fewer unnecessary trips to the hospital or the GP. However, People with patients with limited self-care literacy engage in riskier behavior, have generally poorer health, poor, poorer health, and only use self-care preventatively. So in brief, health literacy is linked with poor health across the life course, and it reduces the capacity to engage in self-care to maintain and improve one's health. So investment in health literacy strategy is critical, and that's why we um, we uh, suggested and developed opportunities for impact. Next slide, please. Where we feel that several stakeholders like us and organizations similar to us and other stakeholders like policymakers, healthcare system decision makers can work together towards a better health environment. And it's important to note that while we want to empower patients in making better health decisions, it is crucial to provide them with the right environment adapted to their need. Therefore, it's important that national societies are designed to fit the health literacy of their population. And as a global federation, we are in the process of forming a global coalition where organizations, key stakeholders can champion self-care literacy and increase self-care literacy advocacy worldwide. We also encourage organizations to provide high quality information that is widely and easily accessible for consumers, patients to make informed decisions and healthier choices. There's as well an opportunity to build self-care capacity as an individual, community, organization and system levels. So for example, enhancing patient's education, but also embedding self-care literacy into professional education of healthcare providers. Building evidence 
uh, an evidence case as well. So research analytical insight for health literacy would benefit and support countries in assessing the health literacy level and as well providing them arguments, convincing arguments for decision makers to make uh, health literacy a priority on the agenda. So just next slide, please. Just to finish off with, uh, with my presentation, I would like to illustrate some of, some of my points with some digital tools that have been showing to enhance health, health literacy. Recently, next slide, please. Recently, we just published a recommendation and guidelines on how, the use of electronic product information. Um, so as you know, with the COVID-19 pandemic, digital world has been accelerated and created an opportunity for the wide use of electronic product information, especially in low and income countries, uh, mid, sorry, low and middle income countries where risk communication was done using digital tools. So there are different benefits in using EPI. And right now we are often using paper leaflet in combination with EPI. In the longer term, we are recommending to use EPI only. So the benefit is to provide the right and trusted information to the patients. So for example, when you have a patient that has specific need, needs, such as the elderly, you could increase the font of the leaflet to ease the reading. You can as well add multiple languages and digital videos to support the understanding of the leaflet to the patient. And that really would prevent uh, error medication. So that's one example of how you can improve health literacy using a digital tool. Next slide, please. And to finish off, let me just share with you two examples of our members uh, who have been uh, developing apps to support their patient and consumers. The first one is from, it's called the Flu Tracker from GSK, who is now, is called Helion, it's, an, it's a new entity. So the flu tracker aims to help patients to cope with the unpredictability of the flu season. So it's, it's trying to understand where is the, uh, uh, the flu forecast in their geographic area of interest and to provide as well customized information on the right product to use um, so they have the right information in hand and reliable and trusted information. The other example I would like to share is the Nicoret Quick Mist Smart Track, which is a nap that comes along with the uh, oral spray to, quit, to help patients quit smoking. And in that there, in here, it was based on behavior science where the data inside would, uh, the, the patient would be able to track uh, the consumption and as well help them change their behavior to quit smoking. But on top of that, the data inside generated is also used to develop new solutions depending on the unmet need of the patient. So it has a double benefit. So saying, uh, finishing on that, I would like to thank you everyone. And I hope this was an informative session on why health literacy should be part of any agenda to improve uh, and empower patients to make better healthcare decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Muriel. I can confirm that it was indeed a very informative uh, presentation. Uh, so thanks very much for explaining how self-care uh, should be part of and is part of uh, the care continuum and uh, the uh, healthcare system. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I really like the flu tracker <laughs> myself as a, as a practical tool. So now we will change uh, perspective and uh, we will move to more uh, hospital settings. Uh, Sandra Butejic, uh, in her speech, will refer back to the strategic framework and how this guidance translates into medication safety culture in uh, hospitals through multiple strategies, simple measures, more sophisticated tools. Uh, so Sandra, how do strategic, technical and operational levels come together to foster medication safety? The floor is yours. And I would like to remind also our par uh, participants, attendees, to leave the questions in the question and answer box, because after Sandra's 10 minute presentation, we will pick them up and we will answer them. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Annette, for that. Um, it is a great pleasure, actually, as president of the European Health Management Association, 
to join the President European Association of Hospital Pharmacists, the CEO of the International Alliance of Patient Organizations, as well as the Program Director of Global Self-Care Federation, to commemorate World Patient Safety Day and emphasizes Emma's role in collaborating with key stakeholders in order to ensure better patient safety and reduction in uh, medication um, harm. So the publication Medication Without Harm was actually launched, formally launched at the second Global Ministerial Patient Safety Summit in Bonn, Germany on 29th March 2017 to reduce severe avoidable medication related harm by 50%. And if we look at the statistics, uh, here we have statistics coming from the United States and the cost of medication errors um, do actually um, make us think that the problem is real. At least 1.5 million preventable adverse drug effects occur in the United States each year. One in every 150 patients admitted to a hospital dies as a consequence of an adverse event. Administration errors account for 26% to 32% of total medical errors. And there's already a question by uh, nurses in the chat. Uh, nurses administer most uh, medications. Um, and unfortunately, most uh, administration errors aren't intercepted. The, the most vulnerable are children. They are three times more at risk of errors than adults because of the complex dose calculations they require. And, and of course, many times, um, healthcare professionals think they can memorize these doses and do not go back and check, but just get on with it. Avoidable cost also from a financial perspective from medication errors is estimated to be about $20 billion with a range of 15 to 28 billion. And up to 9% of inpatients experience medication related harm. We also have evidence from Europe. Uh, indeed, there, there is a high variability across the 27 member states in terms of the risk of suffering one medication error in acute care settings. And of course, um, the variability also um, um, arises from the fact that we have different reporting systems, different research capabilities as well. But in Europe, according to the European Medicines Authority, the medication error rate in the hospital setting varies between 0.3% and 9.1% at prescription and between 1.6% and 2.1% at dispensing stage. We have heard um, also uh, from, from uh, previous speakers uh, that medication errors in hospital setting are preventable. Indeed, we have research coming from Spain that 42.8% of adverse effects are deemed preventable. We also have research from the United Kingdom um, it is estimated that the medical uh, uh, errors, medication errors rate occurring at all stages of medication use was two, uh, 237 million per annum. So I was asked to look at, uh, of course, we are EMA, we are the European Health Management Association, and the perspective uh, from my point of view is to look at what can healthcare, healthcare managers do. And immediately what comes to mind would be the leadership and governance roles and the management roles. What can healthcare managers do to encourage shared responsibility between healthcare professionals? And what tools can managers, healthcare professionals and patients need to ensure the five rights of medication administration to be safely followed? Indeed, as Annette has mentioned, um, the strategic framework, which is uh, actually uh, the third World Health Organization Global Patient Safety Challenge, should guide healthcare managers. It is so concise and comprehensive, and it deals with every aspect 
that needs to be taken into consideration. The four domains being, which is actually the, the very core of the role of healthcare managers, is with regard to the systems and practices of medication. And here emphasizing a systems thinking approach. In, in that, of course, the what sort of leadership, whether the governance structures are in place, whether the operating systems with regard to prescribing preparation and dispensing are in place. How is administration being conducted? And very important, we, we, we find in the strategic framework, the importance of monitoring of patients, the monitoring of drug administration and evaluation to take stock, to do audits. Indeed, we have heard Kawaldi uh, uh, actually talking about patients and the public and what they can do. And the strategic framework gives us very important four subdomains. First, and also uh, my, my, the other speakers um, spoke about the importance um, of public awareness and medication literacy. Um, but, but very important, the involvement of patient organizations, indeed, like the International Alliance of Patient Organizations that draws under it uh, various other organizations. But also important is the empowerment of the public. Uh, and, and this takes me as well to the importance of having person-centered care um, supported more and more so that the patient is not a passive recipient of, of care, but a person, an individual person um, able to take stock of uh, the health and the management in terms of care. And therefore, we need the engagement of the public and we need to encourage the public and the patients to report if there is something that is not going well. We also have the importance of leadership and governance structures to support our healthcare professionals. And that is the and that is the role in terms of leadership, management, and governance to support our healthcare professionals in terms of education and training. Again, from a systems perspective, to ensure that there is continuous professional development, to actually um, uh, get communication, which is one big cause of the errors that happen, in particular in medication errors, um, that the systems should be in place. The team working, teamwork gives us synergy. And uh, if you have more than one pair of eyes, and more than one brain and more than uh, one individual senses, we can pick up and perhaps act as bodies to our colleagues doing a process during the delivery of care. Of course, what is uh, uh, needed as well is to increase the capacity and capability at the point of care. Last but not least, as has been said by previous speakers, the importance of having measurement of having reporting of incidents, of actually learning from this. And we've heard um, as well the, the fourth domain, which is medicines, having, of course, uh, we'll be talking a little bit about the five rights, having the right product at the point of care, managing, again, the system, the operating system has to be built in terms of logistics, storage, disposal. Uh, errors happen because of poor labeling, poor packaging, and we have to be um, also partners of the pharmaceutical industry, so that if during our practice we notice that things are not entirely right in terms of the labeling and packaging, we can also alert the, the companies to, uh, to this effect. Uh, of course, we need to be vigilant about reporting um, and ensuring that the products that we use are of uh, good quality and are safe. Uh, EMA is a partner of ECAMET, which is an alliance that aims to reduce medication errors and promote at European and national levels the implementation of comprehensive electronic traceability systems in hospital settings. And indeed, uh, what ECAMET uh, uh, is doing is actually uh, emphasizing the role of the traceability in preventing errors in acute care settings, 
and um, including the following concepts, namely automated storage and electronic dispensing cabinet systems, the e-prescription and e-preparation system, having electronic scanning systems such as barcoded medication and administration, smart pumps, and of course, full connectivity of systems in the acute care setting. And here, um, three areas which are considered high risk, uh, are oncology, intensive care units, and intravenous medications in hospital wards. But effectively, when we um, actually uh, refer to healthcare managers in terms of their leadership and governance, um, we need to ensure one important aspect, that we support the development and also to support it, the growth of a patient safety culture. Let's look at a recent publication that OECD gave us in 2022. Um, with actually some worrying uh, uh, statistics um, that basically uh, look at uh, look at the culture. Um, the question is how do hospital workers in OECD countries feel about patient safety culture? And indeed, we have forty percent of hospital staff think that staffing levels of, at their workplace are appropriate for ensuring patient safety, which means that more than half think that staffing levels are too low to ensure safe care. And I've already noticed a question in the chat uh, referring to staffing levels of nurses, for example. 46% of surveyed health workers believe that important patient care information is transferred across hospital units and during shift changes, which means that more than half thing important information is lost. And we've already heard other speakers um, referring to where this could be lost when patients are moved or staff changes. 50% half of workers believe that their hospital management provides a work climate that promotes patient safety and shows that patient safety is a top priority which means that leadership support is an essential part of building a strong safety culture and patient safety could become a higher priority for leadership. Another statistic, 52% of surveyed hospital workers feel that staff freely speak up if they see something that may negatively affect a patient and feel free to question those with more authority which means that almost half feel that reporting safety events results in punitive responses to those that report them rather than for learning and improvement. And this is a worrying statistic. So what do we mean by patient safety culture? Uh, patient safety culture is the, uh, encompasses the, the beliefs, the values, the norms shared by healthcare staff. It is what is rewarded, supported, expected, and accepted. And it is the role of the healthcare managers in terms of their leadership, management, and governance that uh, they need to see that this is done. And we should not just say it belongs to the individual healthcare professional. It exists at multiple levels. It exists at the system level, at the hospital level, at the departmental level, and at unit level. And indeed, we still have barriers in this regard that we still tend to uh, adopt a person-centered view of the error. And therefore, we say that there is incorrect execution of procedures, that there has been a distraction, that there has been a lapse, that there has been a communication problem. And therefore, we try to solve it on a one-to-one -one communication and go straight to the person who, who reported the error or might have committed an error. But this is not the correct way to do it. We need to adopt a systems thinking approach, a system focused view of the error and understand and believe that humans are fallible. The Institute of Medicine gave us the classic publication, uh, it is, uh, it is uh, to wear is human. And therefore errors are to be expected, even in the best organizations and even by the best specialists that we have in the system. And the errors are caused by systemic factors. We also tend to um, consider errors in terms of a disciplinary action. 
the incident reporting and inquiry and disciplinary measures. So we tend still to focus on the punitive actions and the threats of denunciation, blame or shame those involved. And we, and we need to have a paradigm shift in this. The changing working conditions to a blame-free culture where we can um, support a learning organizations, where we can dig deeper and, 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 and find out how and why the defenses have failed. Again, going back to the strategic framework, this gives us uh, a very important that medication errors are a common cause of harm to patients in acute care settings. And therefore going a bit more uh, granular into where, where actually medication errors do happen. And these uh, include during prescribing um, um, by physicians. And not all hospitals have digital uh, means uh, in terms of electronic prescribing. So we are still having uh, doctors writing prescriptions. And uh, many times um, errors happen because of lack of proper details, legibility, etc. So we need to understand uh, that we cannot take anything for granted. Um, it also happens at the dispensing and preparation. And here we have the pharmacists as key stakeholders there. And uh, as the statistics show here, we do have errors um, um, happening, but uh, in this case, using a barcode, um, you know, we, when, when we introduce the barcode scanning, a 67% reduction in medication errors. Last but not least, medications onwards, the administration. And this is mostly um, the job of, of nurses and uh, also of doctors, okay? And administration errors were recorded as 39% of all serious medication errors, which reduced to 19% with barcode um, and with using EMAR, a 51% uh, uh, reduction was also achieved. With regard to tools for managers, healthcare professionals, and also patients, so um, this is not a job of, of one key stakeholder, and that is why it is so great to have the key stakeholders joining forces today, because medication errors uh, can be a wicked problem, and therefore we need more than one stakeholder to deal with it. So apart from um, the right uh, drug, uh, the right patient, the right time, the right drug, the right dose, the right route, what we notice here, and now we are also seeing the eight rights, we are seeing also more rights coming in. Um, what we notice here, however, is that the five rights of medication administration focus on the performance of individuals and do not reflect the effect that drug safety is a culmination of efforts of several professionals working within healthcare settings. And these professions include healthcare managers. And why do I say this? Because the responsibility for accurate drug administration lies with multiple individuals who need to work in reliable systems. And there we go again. It's the systems thinking approach that needs to be considered. For example, factors contributed to a medical team's failure to accurately verify the five rights of medication use, despite their best efforts, might include poor lighting, inadequate stuffing, handwritten ineligible orders, also the accuracy of the dose, the trailing zeros, for example, is it 2.1? 2.2 and, 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 and that difference uh, does make a difference when we are dealing with children, for example, infants or the elderly versus two, or is it 0 0.2 or 0.2, which the, 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 you know, the, the point may be missed in action. And all of a sudden you have a dose that is given in, in, a, in a times times 10 or times even, even 100. And we had such cases. Um, also, the lack of effective independent double checking systems. Uh, and this is the work that if you have the appropriate leadership, management and governance in place, then we, have, we can support the healthcare professionals in getting the five rights, as I said, 
now we're having more rights, some publications also consider eight rights, etc. Medication harm risks patients and healthcare professionals' well being and undermines the trust in health systems. And indeed, when uh, healthcare professionals um, get involved, you know, uh, all the healthcare professionals, at least the ones I know in my career, have gone into the healthcare profession um, to help patients, to manage patients, to get the satisfaction that patients are treated, managed, possibly cured. So when this happens, they become victims as well. And indeed, I would like to share with you um, the visibility of a cost action that is currently running. I'm a member of this cost action titled the European Researchers Network Working on Second Victims. I'm leader of Workgroup 4 that is dealing with barriers and facilitators in implementing Second Victims program. And indeed, the person who coined the term um, uh, is uh, actually Albert too who, as a house officer, noticed that another resident failed to identify the, electro the electrocardiographic signs of the pericardial tamponade that would rush the patient to the operating room late that night. And the news spread rapidly, and the case tried repeatedly before an incredulous jury of peers who returned a summary judgment of incompetence. And this influenced Albert Wu and published this on the BMJ way back in 2000. And his work was carried forward uh, by, by, by many, in fact, uh, in, uh, apart from the cost action in Europe, of course, uh, within the United States and also in various parts in Europe, we have now, uh, of course, uh, programs, uh, sec second victim programs to support the healthcare professionals who uh, get caught in a patient terror, which, uh, you know, may, might not be actually a, a, a pure human factor, an individual error, um, as we've said, but it could be a systems error. And indeed, uh, on the 21st April uh, 2021, um, bang in the middle of COVID, I chaired a meeting uh, of Ernst, a leading work group four, where we invited in a, amongst uh, others, Alberto, who shared his experience of um, developing these programs. And of course, in the picture, there are uh, participants from Bats Element Center who have already started in the US uh, with second victim programs, the chair of the action, Professor Miran, my colleague Lucia from the Irish uh, uh, College of Physicians. So this brings me um, to the end. And I would like to, to thank you for, um, I would like to thank the uh, Emma um, executive uh, Director and uh, Secretariat for organizing this webinar and for joining forces again, I repeat, with the key stakeholders in managing uh, patient safety and in, re in reducing medication errors. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sandra, for the uh, passionate uh, speech. We have a couple of questions and I would also have one. Uh, can we uh, give the floor to Mike? I'm asking my technical colleagues if we could unmute. Mike, uh, who asked the first question, Mike Isle, from the audience, would it be possible? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Mike. Hello, yes, thank you very much to all um, of the speakers. Really interesting work. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I won't repeat the question. Um, it's in the chat box, but essentially, it's um, what would the panel advise us, that's the ECOMET Alliance, to ensure that medication errors is properly, fully and duly addressed within the EU pharmaceutical strategy and the EU pharmaceutical legislation, which you will know is being worked on as we speak. Thank you, Mike. Who would like to start? addressing the question. If I, may, I, I see, I, I see quite, uh, quite it, yeah. No, so, sorry. No, oh, sorry, it. sorry, Andras, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Go um, ahead, Andras, yeah. Uh, one aspect that I would like to very much highlight is probably uh, the need to have some built-in metrics to the system 
that is actually not necessarily based on self-reporting, but some sort of an actual independent measurement or audit type of approach towards, uh, towards medication-related harms and medication-related errors, then probably we could have a more, uh, more close and, and more, um, well, detailed um, information on what happens and where and what the roots are. And it's very important, just like Sandra highlighted, that it is not to blame anyone. It is to recognize where the faults lie and where uh, shall the system intervene. So uh, some sort of in-process control or uh, the inclusion of actual uh, real-life evidence gathering metrics is one of the key issues in, in our opinion. Thanks. Thank you, Andras. Uh, Kualit, would you like to add something? Yes. I see that you unmuted yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, for first thing is that the the strategy has uh, started on a good foot. Uh, the patient involvement with it was quite high. Uh, it was mentioned regularly at the EMA's patient and consumer working party when we were discussing things, and even within the European Patients Forum. Uh, so therefore, it's got auspicious uh, signs to it, you know, that the patients are at center of that. So it's not something that's come from the provider top down or bottom up, it's involving us. Uh, secondly, I think the strategy has uh, honestly addressed that uh, no one party or no one uh, individual within Europe and elsewhere has got the answers for this, that we have to work collaboratively. It's gotta be a whole of uh, society, whole of government, whole of EU and whole of uh, patient movement uh, to work on this because it's something that uh, is important to us. And lastly, I think from uh, way of it, the way it's been presented, it started off with good communication. Uh, we are talking about it here, and Mike, thank you for bringing this up again. Uh, it's been mentioned repeatedly in uh, forum after forum. It's not only ECOMAT, but it's really working quite uh, intensively. And having just come back from the WHO's uh, Southeast Asia Regional committee meeting, uh, I can say that I managed to infect them as well with it, you know, uh, ask them to create some uh, uh, ECMA type of uh, groups and have patients within that and maybe look at the European um, uh, strategy for their World Patient Safety Day kickoff as well. So it's just, uh, it started there, but let's keep the momentum. And I'm glad Andrea said, we do need those metrics and follow those. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would you like to see some, uh, add something, Sandra? What has been said? Yes. Um, as, as has been uh, mentioned, I think we need to um, present the business case with evidence. The more evidence we have, the better will be our business case. That's, that's what I have to add. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I would also have a question, but I'm afraid we will not have the time for that. I know that Andres has to leave uh, really short on uh, to catch a plane. So I will uh, move to the conclusions of the, the session. Uh, and uh, actually we had already a, a pre-discussion with our panel. So it is not surprising, but, but uh, Actually, everything that we have pulled together on a on two slides as recommendations uh, for successful implementation of the WHO guidelines, uh, whose um, uh, expected uh, objectives are uh, becoming soon reality. Uh, we hope because uh, the the timeline is uh, coming to an end by the end of this year. So what we have uh, pulled together as recommendations towards successful implementation are create a culture, foster more family and patient engagement, empower patients to be able to make better health decisions, apply systemic and systematic approach to country and institutional levels, monitor results more closely, invest in more research and real-world uh, evidence collection, 
stimulate more unified and accurate picture about the implementation results, initiate more dialogue and collaborative collaboration between stakeholders involved like this webinar, fix measurable indicators and measure results, and report and analyze so that we can pave the way towards further improvement. With that, I would like to close uh, our uh, one hour session. I would like to thank uh, our speakers for the inspiring uh, presentations. And last but not least of all, I would like to thank my colleagues, uh, Adeline Donahoe, who made this um, webinar possible uh, behind the, the scenes. She was uh, uh, moderating in the in the Q and A uh, chat box. I'd like to also thank our technical colleagues Kate and Federica. Thank you, and have a good afternoon. <laughs>